You ready? Give me a high five. Yeah, good boy. Hey guys, it's Abby. Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is a, another true crime case. I am so excited to be back to posting on YouTube and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit at the end. Today we are going to be talking about John Wayne Gacy, AKA the killer clown. Now he actually was born and raised in Chicago, which is where I am from. And his house where the murders occurred was actually only about 45 minutes from where I grew up. I actually have a friend whose dad's best friend was one of Gacy's victims as well, so this case kind of like hits very close to home and it's rather freaky that I have such a close connection with this. So this is a wild one for me. But really quick before we get into the video, I do want to let you guys know that I have created a Google form where you can leave any case suggestions. I'm also taking suggestions for like supernatural type occurrences that you want me to cover. I'm going to do a separate series where I do my makeup and talk about those, but I will link that down below. You can leave any case suggestions or supernatural suggestions that you want me to talk about in upcoming videos. So if you guys like this video and like true crime content be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you can see my other videos when I upload and other than that let's get on into it John Wayne Gacy was born on March 17th, 1942 into an upper middle class family in Chicago, Illinois. For the most part, John had an ordinary childhood, but he did have a very tumultuous relationship with his father who was an alcoholic and was known to be a very angry drunk. John was named John Wayne after the famous cowboy from Western movies. I'm sure you've probably heard of him. My grandma's big fan of John Wayne movies. And he named him this because at the time, John Wayne was a very big kind of masculine symbol in America and that's what he was looking for in his son. As he grew older, his father always felt that he never lived up to his namesake and was never as masculine as he wanted him to be. So that was a big cause for a lot of the issues he had with his father. When John was 11, he was in and out of the hospital with a lot of heart problems and was eventually diagnosed with a congenital cardiac defect, which prevented him from playing sports. But his father just accused him of making up the whole thing to get attention from his mother because he was a mama's boy and to get out of school. His father never believed that he actually had this condition despite the fact that it was diagnosed by doctors in a hospital. And John himself actually has said in an interview that all his life he felt like nothing he ever did was quite good enough for his father. As I mentioned before, John's father was a very angry drunk. So a lot of times when he would drink, he would actually take John or his mother down into the basement and beat them. He would go and berate John for not being masculine enough, things like that, just because he couldn't play sports and wasn't interested in them. And so again, he was never quite good enough in his father's eyes. After Gacy's arrest, his mother actually said that if his father ever knew that John was bisexual or had these sexual relationships with boys, that he would have absolutely killed him himself which says quite a lot about his father's character. Despite the absolute hell that John's father put him through his whole childhood, John absolutely loved and adored him still and everything he did was always trying to seek his father's approval until he ended up passing away, which we will get to later on. On top of all the abuse he suffered at the hands of his father, in 1949, he unfortunately suffered another horrible incident. This was with a man who was a friend of his father's, he was a fellow contractor, and a very good friend of the family. So they all knew him very well. One day, John was alone with him in his truck, and the man decided to sexually assault him. Now this continued time and time again, and John never said anything to his father, because he was afraid that his father would get mad at him rather than the man, which is unfortunately probably true. In 1960, when John turned 18, he decided that he wanted to get into politics. And he did this as a Democrat, which was just another thing that his father looked down upon him for because he was a very, very serious Republican. However, around this time, John's father actually decided to do something nice for him he bought him a car, although there were some strings attached. John had to pay off the car, and until then, it was technically his father's. This was just another way for his father to hold on to him and control him, even once he turned 18. So there were frequently many arguments where if John would pay late or if John did something that his father didn't like, 
he would take away the keys and this got to the point where John eventually had his own keys made because he was getting rather frustrated with being under his father's control. Eventually the situation continued to escalate and he was just so sick and tired of the whole thing that John decided to move to Vegas shortly after he turned 18. John found work with an ambulance service company out in Las Vegas but was shortly after transferred to be a mortuary attendant and unsurprisingly he was very fascinated and very good at this job. While he worked there, he would sleep behind the embalming room in a cot, which is rather interesting. And he admitted that one night while he was there all by himself, he got curious and he wanted to see what a coffin was like. So he opened up a coffin that had a young boy in it and climbed in there with him and just laid there cuddling him for a while before he eventually got really, really freaked out and immediately jumped out and left. And this whole situation freaked him out so much that he decided to move back to Chicago. After three short months of living in Vegas, he headed back to Chicago to live with his parents. When he returned home to Chicago, he decided that he wanted to enroll in business school despite never having finished high school. He was accepted into Northwestern Business College and graduated in 1963. In 1964, John moved to Springfield, Illinois to work at a Nunn Bush shoe company as a salesman and he actually did did very well there and was shortly promoted to be the manager. Now this job is actually where he met his soon-to-be first wife Marilyn Myers and they hit it off right away. After a short six months of dating they decided to tie the knot in September of that year. Shortly after their wedding Marilyn's father invested in owning some KFC franchises so they moved to Waterloo Iowa where he was buying up all these KFC franchises and John actually became the manager of several stores. In February of 1966, Marilyn gave birth to their first child, which was a son, and just a little over a year later, in March of 1967, they had a baby girl. At this point, John said he finally felt like he got his father's approval, which he had been searching for his entire life. He was a successful manager of multiple KFC franchises, as well as having your traditional American family, which is what his father had always wanted for him. And he actually apologized to John and said he was proud of him, which I'm sure was a huge thing for him. At this point, everything in John's life seemed perfect, but it wouldn't stay this way for long. Despite having seemingly the perfect marriage and the perfect children, John was hiding many things from his wife. He would frequently cheat on her with prostitutes, and he had a horrible habit of flirting with the young boys who worked at his KFC restaurants. He would frequently hang around with these young boys, some of them even underage, and made what he called a club in his basement for the boys to come over and hang out in. While they would hang out in this club John created in his basement, he would give these young boys alcohol to kind of lower their inhibitions and make them a little bit more comfortable when he would be all creepy and flirt with them. And the more and more alcohol he would give them, he would kind of test the waters and try to flirt with them and make advances on them just to see how they would react. And if they reacted poorly, he would just kind of like laugh it off and pretend it was a joke and just like a test of their morals, which we all know it was not. In 1967, John committed his first, that we know of, assault on a teenage boy, and this boy was 15-year-old Donald Voorhees. John lured this boy to his house by promising him that he would show him some adult films. But when they got there, John just gave him a bunch of alcohol and convinced him to perform sexual acts on him. John began doing this to more and more of his young KFC employees, and he would tell them that the reason he was doing this was because it was some sort of an experiment, and he would actually pay them $50 afterwards. In 1968, Donald told his father what John had been doing to him and obviously he was horrified. So he went straight to the police who immediately arrested John and charged him with sodomy. John, of course, denied all of this and claimed that he was just being set up. Because how do you explain this to your wife and two kids at home? John was so set in proving his innocence that he insisted on taking a polygraph test 
thinking that if he just acted normal, it would come back and show that he wasn't guilty. However, we all know that that's not how a polygraph test works. And when he was hooked up, it showed abnormalities in his heart rate when they asked if he did anything wrong. As the trial began to approach, John was getting more and more nervous and was trying to get himself out of this situation. So he went to another one of his employees named Russell and paid him to go beat up Donald so he wouldn't testify. Russell did then end up going to beat up Donald and Donald was able to get away and immediately ran to the police station and told them what happened. When the police questioned Russell, he told them that John had paid him to do it. So they ended up charging John with this as well. On September 12th, John was ordered to undergo a psych evaluation. And after many, many days of testing, they did diagnose him with antisocial personality disorder. However, they also decided that he was definitely mentally competent enough to stand trial. He then did go on to plead not guilty for every single one of the charges except for sodomy. On December 3rd, 1968, he was convicted and charged with the one count of sodomy and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. The same day, his wife filed for divorce and he never saw his two kids ever again. In prison, John was viewed as a model prisoner. He was very well liked there and within a few months, he was actually appointed head chef of the prison, which is quite a big deal there and he even began taking some high school classes. His life in prison was actually going very, very well until Christmas of 1969 when he got a call that his father had passed away from liver disease due to all of his excessive drinking over the years. John was absolutely devastated by this news despite all of the abuse his father had put him through for years. And unfortunately, he wasn't allowed leave from prison to attend the funeral, which absolutely crushed him. There are reports that John had thrown himself on the ground and was sobbing and crying uncontrollably because this news just broke him so much. In 1970, John had his second parole hearing, the first of which had been denied. But at this parole hearing, he made the argument that he had taken a bunch of high school classes and was really working to make himself a better person and that he was ready to be put back into the real world and try again. The parole board unfortunately believed him and after only serving 18 years in prison, he was released back out into the world. Which honestly, it frustrates me to no end knowing that if he would have served the whole time that he was supposed to be in prison, none of these murders would have happened. All of these people would most likely still be alive today. When he was released, he was given 12 months of probation and one of the terms of this probation was that he moved back to Chicago and lived with his mother. So on June 19th, when he was officially released, he immediately went back home and moved in with her. John kept a pretty low profile for a while. However, on February 12th of 1971, John was charged with yet another sexual assault of a teenage boy. Luckily for John, not so luckily for the rest of the world, the boy ended up not testifying and John was free to go and his parole officers never found out about this and the police never found out about the fact that he had been released from jail less than a year before for another charge of assaulting a teenage boy. About a month after his probation ended, they sealed up all of his criminal records and he was essentially able to move on like nothing ever happened. Shortly after this, he decided to buy a new house. So with the help of his mother, he found a new house in Norwood Park, a suburb of Chicago in Cook County. Him and his mother lived there together for a while until he eventually got engaged again. In August of 1971, John actually reconnected with an old high school friend named Carol Hoff and they began dating. She had two children of her own from a previous marriage and they got along very well. They very quickly got engaged and then very quickly after that got married and Carol moved in, causing his mother to move out. Shortly after they got married, John decided to start his own contracting business called PDM Contractors, which stands for Painting, Decorating, and Maintenance. Oddly enough, most of his workers were young men, which he would later go on to claim was because they were hard workers and they were motivated and moving up in the company and that it was just better for business. However, I'm sure we all know the real reason why he hired so many young boys. Things at this point were going very well for him again. He was remarried, he was able to establish himself as a very well-liked member of the community, and many people in the area knew who he was solely because of his construction business. He then discovered a group of people who would work as clowns for children's parties and hospitals, and he decided he wanted to get in on this. So he took up a job part-time working with these people to 
be a clown for children's parties and children's hospitals and whatnot, and he called his clown alter ego Pogo the Clown. The clowning was relaxation for me. I enjoyed entertaining kids. Like some people are, uh, you know, they, they unwind in different ways, either, either we're going out drinking or that. I could put on clown makeup and I was relaxed. This is also why he is known as the killer clown. Because of how popular he was in the community and all the good he did there with his little clown thing helping the children, nobody looked his way when numerous teenage boys started disappearing beginning in 1972. Police actually chalked most of these disappearances up to runaways and just assumed that they were gone. On Mother's Day of 1975, John actually came out to his wife as bisexual and said that that day would be the last time that they would ever have sex. This announcement kind of became a turning point in his behavior. He would disappear for long periods of time during the day, only to come back in the early hours of the morning. He would frequently bring back teenage boys to hang out with him in his garage. And one day, his sister in law actually found a very absurd setup in the garage which includes some chains and weird red lights. Then in March of 1976, John and his wife mutually agreed that it was time to get a divorce. Now moving on to the murders, we are taking it back a little bit to 1972, which is where the murder spree slowly began. Over the next four years, John would go on to murder 33 young men most of whom he knew as employees or just random boys he picked up off the street, lured back to his house with the promise of money, jobs, or alcohol. Once he got these boys back to his house, he would frequently give them either alcohol or drugs and then would demonstrate his favorite handcuff trick for them. He would loosely cuff himself behind his back and secretly hold the key to unlock it in between his fingers. He would act like it was magic when he unlocked it with the key and then offer to show the boys how to do it themselves. However, he would put these handcuffs on them and never take them off. Once the boys were handcuffed and unable to get out, John would then proceed to rape and torture them before eventually strangling them with a rope. Here, all you do is you, you wrap it around, you put one knot in it, and I said, then you put a second knot in it, okay? Mm -hmm. I said, then you take a stick and stick it in here and you just turn this. And I said, because it's an tourniquet. I said, that's the only knot I ever learned. Precisely the kind of knot found on the ropes wrapped around the necks of the victims found under the house on Somerdale. On January 2nd, 1972, while his wife and kids were out of town, John picked up 16-year-old Timothy Jack McCoy at a bus stop in Chicago. He promised he would drop him back off the next morning and they headed back to his house. Timothy stayed the night and in the morning, John reported that he woke up to find Timothy standing in his doorway holding a knife. John says that he approached him with his hands up in the air, saying that he was not going to harm him and then I guess covered his face with his arm and ended up cutting himself on the knife. He then says that he grabbed the knife from Timothy's hand, slammed his head against the wall, and went crazy, stabbing him. Unfortunately, when John walked out to the kitchen, he saw that Timothy had just been making them breakfast and had come in to say that breakfast was ready. John at this point, however, had a body on his hands that he did not know what to do with, so he ended up burying him in the crawl space of their home, which was actually where most of the bodies were found and and psychiatrists have analyzed this and said that they think he chose this spot because a lot of the abuse that he got from his father happened in his basement. So this was a very similar place. This murder was essentially the catalyst for everything else that would come to happen because John realized that he got a rush killing this boy and for him, death was thrilling. Later that year, one of John's workers, a 15 year old boy named Anthony, hurt his foot on the job and took a few days off of work to recover. John, knowing that he would be home and injured, took his opportunity and showed up at Anthony's house. John tried to attack him, however, Anthony was very good at wrestling and ended up using a few moves on him. Gacy had pinned Anthony to the ground and handcuffed him, although he didn't realize that he had left one of the cuffs loose, so Anthony was able to wiggle one of his hands out of it. John then left the room for a short amount of time, and when he returned, Anthony, still holding his hands behind his back like he was still cuffed, stood there waiting for him. When John approached, Anthony quick slipped his hand out of the handcuff and attacked John using some of his wrestling moves. After a while of wrestling on the floor, Anthony was able to pin John down and handcuff him. After 
after all this, they sat there and talked and eventually they agreed that Anthony would let John go and they would both pretend like nothing ever happened. In an interview, Anthony actually said that he thinks the fact that he kept his hands behind his back after he got them out of the cuffs was what really saved his life. On July 29th, 1975, John attacked again. This time, it was 18-year-old John Butkovich who actually worked for him. John took him back to his house, handcuffed him, strangled him, and then buried him under his garage floor. Until his body was eventually found years later, John would be considered a missing person, and John Gacy was actually questioned for this because they knew he had connection to him because they worked together. However, police didn't think anything of it, and John was free to go. Over the next two years, John would go on to kill 14 more young boys, most of whom ended up being strangled and buried in the crawl space. Some of these murders included 17-year-old Michael Lawrence Bonin, who was murdered on June 3rd of 1976, 17-year-old Rick Lewis Johnson, who was murdered on August 6th of 1976, 19-year-old William George Bundy, who was murdered on October 26th of 1976. He had left his house telling his family he was going to a party and then never returned, and 20-year-old John Stephen Prestige, who was murdered on the 15th of March 1977. Around April of 1977, John actually got engaged again, and she very quickly moved into the house. However, just as quickly as she had moved in, they decided to call off the engagement and she moved out. About a month after she moved out, the murders continued. Between July 5th, 1977 and December 9th, 1977, John would go on to commit 17 more murders. On December 30th, 1977, John would go on to abduct 19-year-old Robert Donnelly from a bus stop in Chicago. However, this was different than his usual MO. He took Robert back to his house and decided to torture him with a few different methods, including waterboarding. He would do this over and over again, and Robert would pass out, John would stop, Robert would come to, John would resume, and this was a pattern that would go on for hours. Eventually, John put him back in the car and drove him back to where he worked, dropped him off, and then pretended like absolutely nothing happened. Obviously, Robert went straight to the police and reported what happened, but when they questioned John, John said that everything that they did was consensual and Robert was just making a big deal out of nothing. And the police unfortunately believed him. This happened yet again in March of 1978, when John would kidnap 26-year-old Jeffrey Ringnall, bring him back to his house, and torture him for hours on end just like he did with Robert. For some reason, John seemed to enjoy torturing someone until they went unconscious, bringing them back and doing it all over again. So he did this for quite some time before John then put him back in the car and dropped him off in a random street in Lincoln Park, a neighborhood in Chicago. Jeffrey was actually able to crawl his way to his girlfriend's house and then immediately went to the police to report what happened. However, police did absolutely nothing about his report. Then from June 16th, 1978 to December 11th, John would go on to complete his final four murders, the last of which being Robert Peace. Robert Peace was 15 years old and was abducted from the convenience store that he worked at on December 11th, 1978. Gacy had been in the convenience store talking to the pharmacy worker about some upcoming construction there, and Robert had seen him in the store. When John left, Robert decided to follow him out the front door to ask him about possibly getting a a construction job. He was interested in buying a camera and he really wanted to save up some more money for that. When Robert's mother came to pick him up after a shift ended, she was told by the cashier at the front named Kim that Robert had gone out hours ago to talk to John about possibly getting a job and had never returned. After a few more hours had gone by and Robert still was not back, his mother decided to file a missing persons report. When interviewed, many people told police that they had last seen Robert talking to John outside the convenience store. And so this time, they actually looked into him, and they ended up finding the charge of sodomy from back in Iowa. This, for obvious reasons, sent off many red flags in police's mind, and he became their number one suspect almost immediately. They decided that it was best that they place John under 24-hour police surveillance. But John actually enjoyed this. He kind of thought of it as a game. Whenever he'd be out driving, he would always try to drive super fast and try to 
dodge the police. He would go down back roads to see if they could catch up. And when he'd be out in public and people would ask them why they were following him, he would either claim that he was being unlawfully investigated by the FBI or that they were his own personal bodyguards. So he was definitely getting a kick out of this whole thing. He, I don't think, actually thought that he would end up getting caught. One day, when the officers were visiting his house for a usual check-in, one of them asked if they could use the bathroom. While he was in the bathroom, he said that he just smelled this putrid smell coming up through the floor vents and immediately he knew it was the smell of death. For a while, police weren't able to do much other than put him under 24 hour surveillance because they had no reasonable cause to get a search warrant or anything like that. But this, this was what they needed. When the police officer reported what he had smelled, they immediately filed to get a search warrant for John's house. On December 20th, John went in to see his lawyers about an upcoming civil suit he had going on. But when he showed up, the lawyers report that he just seemed very disheveled and exhausted and out of it. While he was in the office, he saw a magazine that had Robert's face on the front. He immediately went over the magazine, picked it up, and he said, the boy's dead. He's in the Des Plaines River. Obviously, his lawyers were confused by this because like, what are you talking about? Like, how do you know this? John then goes on to confess absolutely everything. He literally told them about every single one of the murders over the next few hours and was quoted to say that he was the judge, jury, and executioner for every single one of those boys. As I'm sure you can imagine, the lawyers were absolutely floored by this revelation. I mean, he was just coming in to talk about a civil case and ended up confessing to 33 murders. After all this, John promptly fell asleep in the office and slept there for hours. When he finally woke up, he had absolutely no recollection of all of the things he had just told his lawyers. John then quickly got up and left the office in a hurry, going straight to the gas station. While he was inside, he gave the cashier, Lance Jacobson, a small bag of weed and was quoted to say, the end is near, which Lance told John's surveillance team about. John then drove to Ronald's house, who was a fellow contractor, he went in, gave him a big hug, burst into tears, and said, I'm going down. I've killed 30 people. He then went to go visit two of his victims that had gotten away, Michael Rossi and David Cram. At this point, it was very clear that John knew what was about to happen, and he was honestly just preparing for the end. After speaking to those two, he then went and visited his father's grave and then just drove around aimlessly for a few hours. Police at this point were getting pretty concerned because they really thought that John was either gonna try to run away or kill himself. So they decided to arrest him because of the bag of weed that he gave the cashier, just so he would be in police custody and they can make sure nothing would happen to him and he wouldn't run away. At this point, the search warrant was granted and police headed over to his house to begin searching. When they initially tried to check the crawl space, it was flooded. It was just a marshy mess because John had ruined his sump pump intentionally in hopes of trying to ruin evidence or help himself out in any possible way he could. Honestly, he was just grasping at straws at this point. Finally, after all the water was drained and the sump pump was fixed, police got to work. And I'm sure you can imagine how shocked they were to discover what they did. They had no idea how big this case actually was about to be. Within the first few minutes of digging, they found an arm bone and immediately called back to the station and told them to start writing up murder charges for Gacy. Not too long after that, the police began to realize the severity of the situation, so they decided to call it a night and they would come back tomorrow. When they came back in the morning, they actually brought Gacy with them and he was rather cooperative and showed them everywhere he had buried the bodies. He had actually thrown his last few victims off a bridge into the Des Plaines River, which was a local river, and he even brought police to the area where he had thrown the bodies in to help them find them. By the end of the search, they had found a total of 29 bodies in Gacy's house, most of which were buried under the crawl space. And they ended up finding four of the five bodies that were thrown into the Des Plaines River. His murder spree was first discovered on a cold December day when the first of his victims were found in the crawl space beneath his home. They were taken out one by one as the world watched. At this point, all of the bodies were severely decomposed and they had to be identified by dental records. Unfortunately, to this day, five of the bodies still have never been identified. Obviously, at this point, there isn't a shadow of a doubt that Gacy had something to do with the Robert Peace disappearance, not to mention the fact that they had found 29 bodies in his home. So there was no way the police could just shrug it off this time. He ended up being charged with the murder of 33 young men 
and his trial began on February 6th of 1980. John decided to plead not guilty by reason of insanity, but after being evaluated, they found that he was completely mentally competent to stand trial. Within just two hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty on all 33 counts of murder and recommended that he get 12 death penalties for this. As I'm sure you can imagine, all the families of the victims were absolutely thrilled by this outcome. I mean, he was a monster who took away their sons. He, of course, spent years trying to appeal this, which obviously is his right, is anyone's right who receives the death penalty, but every single appeal ended up being denied. However, while he was waiting on death row, he did pick up an interesting hobby. He decided to start painting, and the thing that he loved to paint the most were clowns a lot of which resembled his alter ego, Pogo the Clown. I actually was able to see one of these paintings in person when I went to the Zach Bagans Museum, and let me tell you, it was so eerie being able to see that right in front of you. Knowing that John Gacy himself had painted that was a bizarre experience, to say the least. Eventually, John's death date was set for May 9th, 1994. For his last meal, John requested a bucket of fried chicken from KFC, some strawberries, some french fries, some fried shrimp, and a Diet Coke. A lot of fried stuff in there. Eventually, when he was put to death, he didn't have the normal reaction that a lot of people have, which is either anger or sadness. He was actually relatively calm, and his last words were, Kiss my ass. People from all over were celebrating this on the day that he was put to death. There were crowds and crowds of people celebrating. Because, I mean, he is a horrible, horrible man. I mean, he's known as one of the deadliest serial killers in America, so. But yeah, that is it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I wanted to touch on a couple things at the end. So starting now with this video, I am going to be back to posting regularly on YouTube. I know I've been all over the place with YouTube the past few years. But I am going to be posting on Fridays at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Pacific Standard? Is that what PST, PST stands for? I don't know. Either way, 2 p.m. PST on Fridays is when I'm going to be posting. As I also mentioned at the beginning of the video, I have made a Google form for any case suggestions, anything you want to see me cover in the future. There is just a few simple questions, including the classification, whether it's missing person, murder, solved, unsolved, or supernatural, the name of the victim, the location and just a brief background to get me started on the research. So definitely please check that out and leave me a suggestion for which videos you want to see because I definitely want to continue making videos on cases that you guys are interested in learning more about. But yeah, that is all I have for this video. Oscar wanted to pop in and say a little goodbye. Again, thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you can see my next video when it comes out, and I will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>